Thank you guys for having me here. I think you guys are probably the Sherlock Holmes of metaphysics. You're going to unveil and solve the mysteries. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll do my part to contribute a, a little bit to that. Um, when we talk about a theory of something, usually what we mean is that uh, we want to have a reductive explanation for that thing. In other words, we want to explain that thing in terms of something else that is simpler. Um, that is in general uh, one possible meaning for the word theory of something. Another one is that you have a predictive model, that you don't reduce it, you don't know what it is, uh, but you can predict its behavior accurately. Um, when we talk about a theory of mind or a theory of consciousness, if we mean by that, that we need to reduce mind or reduce consciousness to something that isn't consciousness, then and, and that's not what uh, Bernard means, by the way. Um, but if that's what some people mean by a theory of consciousness, that we are looking for a way to reduce it, um, I think we will always fail because our reduction base is wrong. Um, you see, in science, you can't explain one thing in terms of another forever. Uh, at some point, you have to hit what we call a, a ontological primitive, the simplest thing in nature that exists in and of itself and cannot be explained in terms of anything else. Uh, and you know when we we've chosen it right, because uh, although we can't explain that primitive, we can explain everything else in terms of the primitive. Now, today, uh, some of the popular primitives in science are you now the menu of elementary subatomic particles of the standard model, or uh, the menu of different quantum fields in quantum field theory, or the brains of uh, M theory and super string, uh, uh, super string theory. Um, but all of them fail in two senses. One, there is never a single primitive. You always postulate more than one uh, inexplicable thing in nature, which is not very parsimonious. And two, you fail to explain the biggest and sole given datum of existence, which is conscious experience uh, in terms of that primitive. So I think that choice is wrong. I think to get to a so-called theory of consciousness, what we need to do is to put consciousness in, in the primitive, in our reduction set, and explain everything else in terms of consciousness. And if that's not possible, then we go for the next best. But guess what? I think it's completely possible. To find such a theory. It is entirely possible to explain all data of empirical experience in terms of patterns of excitation of consciousness. Yes, not your consciousness alone, not my consciousness alone, a sort of, you know, unbound uh, field of, uh, of subjectivity underlying all nature, of which we are just dissociated segments. Uh, but it is possible to explain the entirety of empirical experience in terms of that um, extended consciousness, if you will. Well, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, you realize, uh, Bernardo, this is wonderful for us, in a sense, as people who are interested in the transpersonal and the spiritual and so on, because it seems that you and, and Philip Goff and Galen Strawson and other panpsychism and so on is at least beginning to open some doors towards things which Buddhist mystics have said since before the birth of Jesus, since you know, the, the Buddha, and that a, a lot of people in our field constantly say today, I mean, there are books by Pim Van Lommel or Dean Radin, which have words like universal consciousness or, you know, con continuing consciousness after death in their titles. It, yeah, I mean, I almost, I feel sort of almost nervous on your behalf. You do know, and of course you do know, but you do know that you're opening a door to what many people still regard as woo-woo. You know, this this spiritual stuff that we go in for. I mean, it would be wonderful if we could affect a marriage, but this is a very delicate proposal that you're making. I think it's all about uh, how you articulate your views. If you articulate your views based on the values that are espoused by the mainstream today, meaning, you know, logical consistency, uh, empirical adequacy, uh, uh, conceptual parsimony, you don't want to postulate more things than you need to explain the world. Um, if that's your approach, if that's how you argue, then there is no woo-woo. And I think uh, uh, all but the least serious pseudo scholars uh, uh, acknowledge this. This is not, this is not an issue. Um, it is only an issue for people who aren't really interested in, 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 in 
studying the possibilities and coming to truth, they are already publicly committed to a certain position, yeah. to a certain character, a certain personality type, which is about, you know, attacking and making fun of others. And if you're committed to that, then you, you may try to shoot holes in what uh, Galen is saying, what I am saying, uh, but it backfires rather quickly. It has backfired. And, and I'm not saying that's to pump me up. And it's not difficult for these things to, back, to backfire when the critic is not a real deep thinker or hardly a thinker. Um, it has backfired for a couple of them. You know, they stepped on some minds they didn't see coming. So today, uh, I sort of get a free pass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to hear that. I mean, I'm I'm so excited because it feels to me so new because we've been banging our head against the materialist wall for so long. But it isn't actually that new. I mean, in my own attempts at understanding the history of philosophy, of course, Plato was an idealist, and they say that Hegel was an idealist, and you are now coming around for the third time as an idealist. And I, I'm sorry to say that I, though I welcome you with open arms, nonetheless, I did think after I'd considered idealism that it was just impossible. And yet out of the woods, there now emerges this thing which is much more possible than simple realism or simple physicalism. You know, most people, uh, even intelligent people, so this is not a criticism, this is just an observation about the cultural dynamics we are immersed in, like fish in the water, and don't even notice that this is what's going on. Mm. Most people, especially materialists, do not understand what materialism is, entails, or implies. They just do not understand it. Uh, and most people do not understand what idealism is either, to the point that they invert the two. Uh, it's very common for someone to say idealism is wrong because reality is not all in your head. Hmm. Well, it's materialism that says that. It's materialism that says that the world you experience, the colors, the, 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 the flavors, the aromas, the melodies, that stuff with qualities uh, is produced by your brain inside your skull. There are no colors out there. There are no melodies out there. There are only abstract entities that we can describe through mathematical equations, but they do not have any qualities. Qualities are something that are magically conjured up by the brain in a way that they cannot pin down inside your skull. So it's, it is materialism that says that the inner surface of your skull is beyond the stars you see in the night sky, insofar as the stars you see are experienced qualities of color, of brightness and so forth. And idealism says precisely the opposite. Idealism says um, reality is not inside your head. Um, and your mind is not inside your head either. It is your head that is in your mind as an appearance of certain mental processes. Therefore, the real reality is qualitative and it is indeed outside your head. This is idealism. And that's the intuition of most people. But materialism has played a fantastic game, fantastically successful game of steel and switch uh, based on flagrant misunderstanding of the issues. Um, and it has caught on in the culture. Most people who consider themselves smart skeptics, <clears throat> they will poo-poo idealism for exactly the reasons that they should be pooing materialism if they only understood uh, uh, what it was. I can give you an example. Uh, there is this famous uh, skeptical biologist, Jerry Coyne, and he, he attacked me twice and backfired twice on him. But the last time he, he was making a point that, uh, you know, uh, uh, every living being has qualia, has experience. Even a Daphnia, a microscopic crustacean that lives in water, even Daphnia have experiences, have the qualities of experience. Even bacteria have experiences. Well, yes, I agree with him, but materialism doesn't. Materialism says that experience is something that appears out of unfathomable neurological complexity. Uh, a bacteria has not only no nervous system, it doesn't even have nervous cells. Um, it's just a little goo <laughs> of, of material dispersed. And yeah, there are some chemical factories and some energy, some, some uh, uh, power stations uh, in the form of mitochondria. Um, but if you say that uh, a cell is already conscious, then uh, it's up to you now to explain 
how a bacteria for which we have a complete biochemical map, we know the, every detail of what's going on there, you have to explain how that generates the qualities of experience, which is of course impossible. And that's why to save materialism, people will say, well, we don't know how this great complexity of a sophisticated vertebrate nervous system generates consciousness, but one day we will know. It's hiding behind ignorance. It's hiding behind uh, the unknown. Um, but Jerry uh, sort of contradicted that by saying in his mind, bacteria have experience and he's a materialist. So make sense of that. I mean, um, materialism is carried, um, carried on the back of ignorance today. It's the biggest thing it has going for it. It's ignorance.